terrifying me, I guess, you know. But how much you actually can tell about me from this image? Clearly, there's large parts of me that don't get addressed by this picture. Does it make sense? Yeah? Uh, yes? I have a question. If there's a, an object and we relate, I'm supposed to reuse. Sorry, is that what I Relate to metaphors, or so reuse it as a metaphor. Is it tied to an object? No. Like, what do you mean, use it as a metaphor? So, like, you have to. You say, I, I'm full like a jar. Yeah, would you be turning the thing itself? Would you be working on the presentation? I do. Or you know the thing is and say, okay. Well, when you, you when you talk about the jack, look, this is not something Heidegger is talking about directly, but I can sort of just think about it with you for a second. If you talk about the jack as a metaphor, uh, then to what extent you actually get the sense of the jack itself? You know, um, I don't think you get. I think I think the jack does does operate well, as, as a metaphor. It operates as an image. Yeah? Um, that, that it still doesn't help us to understand the essence of the jar. Yeah? So, um, so in the same way that, going back to what I was saying earlier, in the same way that the, the picture on, in your passport is a representation of you, but it doesn't really capture loads of things about you, your likes and dislikes, your your, you know, your place in the world, lots of things about you are not in the picture. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Do you understand that? Yeah? I think it, uh, it may might be related to how we, uh, how we conceive your picture. If I see it uh, as a photo or as an ID that I can, I can uh, identify you, then it's a representation. Yes. But if I know you as a person, yes. when I see this picture, you might be, uh, it might be, it reminds me of you as a person, so it might be not a representation, but something. Yeah, else. well, if, if, you, if you know me, it might remind you, it remind you, that's right, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that it's still not, it only captures one aspect of me. Basically, what I want to say, let's say, if I am all of this, the picture captures a very tiny area, you know? What about everything else? It doesn't get into the picture, yeah? Uh, what about, you know, the back of my head? It's not in the picture, you know? So that's what I'm trying to do. It's, it's just so you get the sense in what way. It's not that the representation is wrong, but it's very limited. It only gives you what the representation is able to capture. And everything that it's unable to capture falls outside and gets missed. Yeah. So the first, that was the first point uh, Heidegger tackles in this essay. Think about it in relation to the objects you are working with. The second, um, the second one was well, maybe the jar is a vessel. Yeah. Maybe it is uh, a tool with a purpose. Uh, but the jar is not a vessel because it was produced. Rather, it must be produced, yeah, so it must be produced because it is a vessel. So we get the sense that it's not because it, it, the, the essence of the thing is not because manufactured. It was, it was manufactured because of its essence. Yeah? So we cannot use manufacturing or production as a way to get to the essence of the jar. And then there was this point that we discussed last time again. Um, yet, the jar, what's that? Yet, the jar does consist of sides and base. By virtue of what the jar consists of, it stands. What would the jar be if it did not stand? At the very least, a failed jar. And therefore, always still a jar. Namely, one that indeed involved but, a con but as constantly toppling over, it is a vessel that spills. But only a vessel can spill. Only a vessel 
in speed. We remember we spoke about it that even a broken jar, is a broken jar still a jar? Well, Heidegger says even a jar that spills on all its contents is still a jar. So, so holding the liquid in is not the essence of the jar because even a jar that spills is still a jar because only a jar can spill. The notebook cannot spill. It can do other things. Now, I know you might be sitting here and thinking, well, what, what all this has to do with anything? So, it's really trying to get to an intimate relationship with a thing. You know, that can be a world or a uh, body, you know. How do you, how do you really get to, to a space of intimacy with something? Yes. Uh, I will go back to that thing just... Uh, this one? No. Yes. Yeah. So how does this... Uh, so this basically means the job is produced because... The job? The job is manufactured because of the essence of holding. Yes. And how does it relate to the... To existentialist... Sorry? How does it relate to the, uh, to the existentialist philosophy of... Uh, existentialist? Well, why should it relate to existential philosophy? It's because it's written by Heidegger. And? And this, so Heidegger is not an extensionist. No, no, no. no. Okay. Heidegger is a phenomenologist. It's phenomenologist. Yes. So existentialism. So this basically means essence comes before existence or what? Uh, well, essence comes before existence. I don't do this. Uh, um, well, Heidegger is not using this way of thinking. Okay. Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre who actually was deeply inspired by this essay, uh, Heidegger, um, Sartre believes that existence comes before essence. Ha and Sartre is an existentialist. Heidegger has a huge problem with existentialism, and he gets into it in the, in the beautiful essay that's called Letter on Humanism, in, uh, in a book that's called The Basic Writings. Heidegger with this essay. Uh, Not many of you will actually need to read it, but, uh, but that's about how Sartre misreads Heidegger, you see? Uh, and if you're interested in that, that's where you will find some answers. I cannot really spend time on talking about it, also I don't think that it's particularly relevant. Existentialism um, is, is, is a interesting philosophy, but that's not what Heidegger is trying to do. He's really trying to find what is the closest thing to us as humans, as mortals. What is the closest thing to us? And he says, well, it must be things, because we are surrounded with them. And how do they really get to know the thing as a thing? It's not a question of what comes before existence or essence. It's how do you get to know something. It can be yourself, yeah? Or or a person. How do you get to know something? So this is this way of inquiring. Um, so we also read this, which I thought is really quite nice. The thinghood of the of the vessel by no means rests in the material of which it consists, but instead in the emptiness it holds. And that makes me think about Leanne's uh, installation uh, last Monday, I believe. Because you remember the, the what they were called, um, not roads, the, this, branches. Huh? Branches. the branches, yeah, yeah, these, these branches. So you might say with Heidegger that the, the thinghood of your sculpture or your object or your thing is not in the branches but in the emptiness. Yeah? It's the emptiness that the branches create that is the work. The branches, in a sense, are our secondary. Does it make sense? Yeah? That it's that you, you somehow, you might say, let's say in your essay, you, because as you remember, the question is in what way your, your practice 
is developing alongside the centers, you might say that in, in this work, your, um, the, the materiality is actually not the branches, but, but nothingness or emptiness. And the branches are only there to, um, to hold it using Heidegger's work, Heidegger's work. Yeah. Um, did you get uh, an email from Pat with all the instructions for the assessment? Are you fine with that? Do you want to have a chat about it at some point? Yeah. Okay. Uh, soon? Later? Is she coming by the app? Is she saying she's coming? Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's fine. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, you remember, then there was another position that Heidegger anticipates that will be strong with him, which is that according to physics, anyway, the jack always full with something, whether it is air or water. And you remember? This is a very nice point when he says these suppositions of physics are correct. By means of them, science represents something actual according to which it objectively judges. But is this actual something a judge? No. Science only ever encounters that which its manner of representation has previously admitted as a possible object for itself. I think this is a tremendous sentence and page uh, 8. It's a tremendous sentence. Science only ever encounters that which its manner of representation is previously admitted as possible object for itself. <coughs> uh, I would tattoo it on my arm, you know, uh, because it's just such a beautiful sentence. What do you think it means? How do you understand it? Does it mean that science is always wrong? It's a limitation. Yeah, and what is the limitation of scientific thinking? You are absolutely right. What is uh, the limitation? It's, uh, it, it puts the thing as a representation. Science only knows how to represent. So whatever science is interested in, it will only see it as a representation. Think about science in terms of photographer with a camera. Photographer walking around with a camera. Whatever they see in the world, then they will make it to a picture. That is the key. You know, you show them an elephant, picture. You show them a mice, a mouse, picture. You show them a drought or bushfire, picture. You show them, you show them refugees crossing the, 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 the Mediterranean in a rubber dinghy, picture. You know, you show them a hospital bed, picture. Yeah, that's what the photographer knows how to do. So they never fail to break a picture, but that's the only thing they can do. If you ask them, why did you help the refugees? Well, I'm a photographer. I, I, I take pictures. You know? Uh, why didn't go and uh, you know help with the fire? I took a picture. So that's like science. Doesn't mean that the, the photography is wrong or bad. No. It just means it it imposes on itself a certain discipline, and it can only see what this discipline allows it to see. Now, I want to, to ask you something. Is it the same with art? Is art also like science? It depends. Huh? It depends. On what? Well, it depends in what sense. Does it also depend with photography? Is photography art? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that, 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 I think, will become clear from this discussion. Uh, is art the same? No, no. Why not? Good. Who said that? Okay, Ruth. Hello. <laughs> we no. missed you. Why not? It's not. Why not? Uh, because uh, 
because art isn't uh, determinative in that way. It's, it's uh, descriptive. Like it's it's not bound by a, by a, that that ratio of perspective and uh, you know. And you are absolutely right. I think I think I I. Do you see what where Ruth is coming from? By the way, I just want to introduce Ruth. Ruth uh, graduated last year with a very excellent degree from BA Fine Art, and she was uh, lurking on this seminar last year uh, quite a lot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've been, uh, we've been through some uh, quite interesting discussions in the past. So, I think the difference between art here and uh, science, and also, let's say, photography, is that Art doesn't approach its thing, or it or doesn't look through a predetermined prism. The whole point of art, I think, is that you can always do something different. You know, um, if you want to make, if you want your art to be rescuing people. From around, from around the world, that can be art, you know? If you want your art to be making sculptures from marble, that can also be your art. If you want it to be cooking uh, noodle soup, you know, and, and feeding people, that also can be art. Um, it doesn't have this predetermined um, representational perspective that you carry with you as an instrument. Yeah? So, yes? I think for science, if you repeat it, it creates value. For art, if you repeat it, it diminishes values. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it's, it sounds good. Generally, I think it sounds good. Uh, maybe not, uh, not so good. But, uh, uh, it, you know, it's not so much a question of value. It's, it's really very, very fundamental. Um, in, in contemporary art, of course we're talking here about contemporary art, because traditional classical art was very much like photography. Yeah. It was aimed at representing things very accurately. But since art kind of freed itself from this representational paradigm, um, and there's nothing that tells an artist how exactly to approach their whatever. Yeah. So, and for that reason, walking into an art gallery, you know, you don't know what you're going to see. If I invite you to come with me to a photography exhibition, like, oh gee, yes, I know exactly what I'm going to see. There will be a room. There will be walls. There will be frames on the wall. The frames will be black, and in the frames there will be pictures. And you don't even need to go because here you saw, you saw everything. Does it really matter what is the picture of? Maybe that luminous, beautiful, black and white street observations by Henri Cartier-Bresson. Maybe that is colorful, tiny cheek picture by Martin Parr, you know? But in the end of the day, it's just pictures in frames, on the wall, at high level. And so, there are some exceptions, you know? Walter Tillmans, for instance, works in a different way. Uh, because he uses art thinking in relation to photography. So of course, it's nice to have rules because you can break them. Uh, but if, 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 I, if I invite you to come to an art exhibition, can you tell in advance what it's going to be? There's really no way of knowing. Maybe it will be an empty room with absolutely nothing there, apart from the one ping pong ball and it from the ceiling. And that's it. Maybe it will be completely covered with sort of, you know, toilet paper and rubbish up to the ceiling. Maybe there was a show by uh, uh, by uh, Tom, um, Thomas Hirschhorn in the South London Gallery when he made it look as if the gallery was gone, the ceiling fell in. Did you see it? I saw sure. You say it was amazing. It was just <laughs> the whole gallery was completely full of rubble and rubbish. And, Big bags, and it just looked like it was bought. Which uh, was it? It was uh, Thomas Hirschhorn. Uh, 
than South London Gallery. South London Gallery is a, is a very nice art space, and if you get a chance to visit, you should go. So yeah, look at that. Okay. Brilliant, huh? Yeah. Really, really, really. Do you like it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, this is so great. what's so great about it is that you can't tell in advance what you're going to see. But at the same time, on a different day, in the same gallery, there could be a person sitting on a chair playing flute, or there could be paintings, or there could be glass boxes with bones. So, so there's just no way of telling. I can see it like. So Thomas Hirschhorn is definitely an artist to uh, explore. Fantastic uh, work. And there are some books in the library. And, uh, and occasionally there are also exhibitions in... Uh, yeah. Imagine more walking into a space like this. Um, so, that what I think is different about art, that it doesn't have a, a pre-given framework. Yeah? Um, that was nothing but that what was really nice about your install on the Monday, on, on last Monday. It's in a sense, every install, that's what I love so much about these afternoons, is that there is no knowing in advance what we will see. Every time is a is a mystery, is a surprise. Every time I walk away with a different idea of what art can be. Yeah? So this is not something that is possible in either photography or science. Now some here some people might say here, yeah, but what about uh, quantum science? And yeah, with quantum physics. Uh, things are quite different, but we're not going to forget. When, when, and when um, Heidegger speaks about science here, he speaks about science in the traditional, perhaps Newtonian uh, sense. So that, that's the little caveat. Now, this I think is also quite nice. Uh, let's see what, what it says here. So you have this sentence now. You you you. You bear in mind, science only ever encounters that which its manner of representation has previously admitted as possible object for itself. So it's in advance determined what science can find out when it looks at the thing. It can only find out what its tools, its framework, allows it to investigate. Yeah? Okay, the next paragraph, uh, I wonder if someone could read, and it would be good if someone from that side will start this time, because last time, last week, I think everyone on the other, uh, on that uh, part of the table was reading. So could someone maybe read to us just this paragraph, which is say. But what is it convincing us of? It's convincing us that instead of a jar filled with wine, what we have is a cavity in which fluid expands. Yet, yeah? whether it is wine or water or air, you know, science doesn't see a jar with wine. 
science sees a cavity with fluid. For science, whether the jug is filled with wine or with or with air, it doesn't matter. Science doesn't distinguish between full and empty because the empty is still full with air. So scientifically speaking, the jug is always full. So it is not even a jug; it's a cavity. Yeah. So you see what happened? Science annihilated the jug even before the nuclear bomb comes and wipes everything out, Heidegger says, science already wipes everything out by looking at it purely in terms of cavities and volumes of liquid. Yeah? So in a sense, Heidegger here sounds very, very anti-scientific. Yeah? And in a sense say that science makes the thing, the jug as a thing, as part of our lived world, into something negligible. Yeah? And it's a kind of, I think it's a warning against being seduced by the scientific discourse. That is my one and only um, of sort of criticism of Greta Thunberg. Uh, you know Greta Thunberg, who is, uh, she's a, a young person, she might be 16, maybe 17, she just spoke with, in Davos uh, the other day. Um, and um, she is, uh, she, her thing is that she speaks about the climate. And she says, she, she started these uh, school strikes, strike, uh, strikes mm -hmm. for, uh, for climate in Sweden. So, and, and her, her most sort of familiar slogan, she says, is um, listen to the scientists. Scientists, listen to the scientists, what they have to say about climate, what they have to say about what we need to do to prevent um, the catastrophe. And I think she's wonderful and very, uh, very convincing and give a huge amount. But I am a bit concerned with this listen to scientists because I think it's the scientists who brought us to this point as well. Um, and and it's, it's not also, you know, uh, I, I heard other people say that, you know, yeah, we can listen to the scientists, but before the scientists, people who been living on the land, like the Aboriginal people in, in um, Australia, like the First Nations in Canada, like the in the indigenous uh, American people in the United States, like the uh, people who live in Africa, they were talking about what we, as the Western civilization, do to the climate and the earth and to these people for a very long time. Uh, and no one takes any notice. So it's great to listen to the scientists, but we also need to listen to the people who, for, who have already this connection with the land and the air and the world that we lost and now realize that we probably need to try to somehow recover even though it is probably too late. I don't see yes. why this counting. Say again? I, I don't see how this counting, like, she's not saying only listen to scientists. Well, she, she, no, she doesn't say only, but she says listen to the scientists. And I think, yes, I said, it's good to listen to the climate scientists, but there's also other people who could be listening like the indigenous populations. Yeah, you know? but she's also doing that in kind of like in an environment where there are people, first of all, in power, secondly, men, yeah. secondly, like Asian cases. Yeah. So yeah. she can't just potentially go and say, listen to indigenous people. She has to put in someone who has more supremacy over men in this I think that, and I think I think you're right. Strategically, she probably they're doing the right thing. Um, at the same time, I think forgetting the voices of those people, as I just mentioned, the indigenous people, and not having the, the voice being heard is a continuation of this Western notion that we know best. Yes. Yeah, I think this is a. And like defend our practices by saying humans can engineer their way out of it. So whenever we get that, uh, like before it gets that bad, we have a solution. Yeah. Science solves 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, we're trying to change the security because of five hundred practices. So I can see like why is it dumb. I think it gives you the same task. I think it's Einstein or maybe some I don't know who said that. But it says with if there's a question or problem, you cannot uh, solve this problem by the uh, or if there's a question, you cannot answer this question by what raises this question. It's right. It's, it's right. Very That's good. Right. Yeah. There is this uh, expression. I think it is from the Bible, and uh, and it goes like this: Can the master's tools dismantle mm -hmm. the master's hands? Mm -hmm. Have you? Have you? Can you see that? Can the master's tools dismantle the master's house? So, can you, uh, can you, it's exactly as you say, can you use the, the same tools that build the house in order to take this house apart? Yeah? So, science brought us to this point. Can we use science to also save us? I think there might also be a question of revaluating what is intelligence. Yeah. Because there's a sort of anti intellectualism that says what science says about the environment is just make believe rubbish. So I think what she says in listening to the scientists, it's sort of not poor to at least think about what they yeah. say. But at yeah. the same time, it, it does posit what yeah. the scientist says yeah. as yeah. supreme. Yeah. Like, listen, I really don't want to think for a second that they somehow want to argue with uh, with Greta Thunberg. I really think she is wonderful and completely amazing. Um, but I do think that this notion that only science can save us is, uh, well, at least according to Heidegger, there is a problem there. Yes? Um, yes? Sorry? Andrew Lloyd. No, no, at Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord. And how do you know that? Okay. Uh, yes. I found it earlier. Is it really about Greta and science? More so in context of this. Yes. By saying do this, you don't have to presume that they're saying not to do everything. And science here is one tool, one language format to describe the judge in a way. It's not by saying that science says that this isn't a judge, it's a cavity. It's not saying that it's only a cavity. And that's where science doesn't say that it's only a cavity. It's, it's, it's your knowledge, your ontological understanding of the judge. You can understand where science is coming from, understand the cavity language, and also understand that it's more there's more than that, but you can recognize its cavity-ness quality, you know? So you say science doesn't claim to be all there is to know. I'm saying that you can, you can read science as none of us are card-carrying scientists, but you can read that science is one form of um, like it's a quantifiable knowledge of the world. You can, yes, but is but at the same time, there is a ten. I think what Heidegger is speaking about is this tendency to put this blind thrust into scientific knowledge as if it is the final and ultimate truth. Mm. Yeah, and, and and I understand that. I just feel like this is going back to the binary and the black and white. Yeah, he's considering it negligible. And what? Well, if you're pushing it say, if, if you if you're saying science is the truth, the, yeah. the only truth to so help God, then there's a problem there. But on the opposite side, if you're saying science assumes that everything it says is the entire truth, that way we've now created a, a binary where you have to choose. Yeah. And and if we were to, to go into the you know the barrage yeah. Aspect. That would kind of oppose the higher, higher, higher. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But, but, but has a much more nuanced approach than Heidegger. It is true. Heidegger is quite practical in, in the way he, he, and I guess Heidegger is quite binary in the way he poses it. You know, we don't look to Heidegger as a sort of the last goal. 
okay, just one step in our discovery. But look at the next paragraph where we kind of started already um, last week. So uh, who could read this, uh, the next one? Within its purview. Um, within its purview. Within this, uh, its purview, that object, the component uh, knowledge of science has already emulate the things as he thinks long before the automatic bomb exploded. I think that's enough. So, within its purview, that of objects, and that's, that's a question for you, Zach. Uh, the compelling knowledge of science has already annihilated the thing as a thing long before the atomic bomb exploded. So, how, what do you hear Heidegger saying here? Maybe a few more lines will help. I will read it. The explosion of the atomic bomb is only the crudest of all crude confirmations of an annihilation of things that occurred long ago. Confirmation that the thing as thing remains nullified. Is it that? Exactly. One second. The annihilation is so uncanny because it brings with it a twofold delusion. Will, yes. I was just wondering, is it that if you start seeing things as things and you forget their essence, the creation of something to slow down things? It's almost as if science be leading a crusade against things. Science wants to replace all things with their representations. Yeah? So it's a bit like Plato's cave. What is Plato's cave? All the real things are replaced with representations on the wall. Yeah? It's just that now, who are the people who hold these strange objects in front of the fire to, cope, to throw the shadows? Heidegger says it's the scientists. Mm. And the images we see on the, on the wall now is scientific knowledge. Yeah? But this scientific knowledge annihilates what is really going on of which now we don't have any idea because where there used to be a jar, we see a cavity. Where there used to be a, a stream running down the mountain and bubbling along, you know, the sound that the stream makes and, and kind of running down into the valley, there is a turbine that accumulates the water, creates massive pressure, generates energy and lights up the, the lights in the village and the city. So we don't have the brook anymore, we have power station. Where there used to be a field, there is now a, a fracking uh, operation that uh, sort of you know, pushes gas at huge pressure into the layer, geological layers to extract gas. So the field will be where wheat used to grow and used to sort of roll in the wheat in the summer and lie on your, on your back and look at the clouds. There is now, you know, Every square meter of this field is worth millions because of what you can get out of it. Where there used to be a mountain, there is now a, a mine for gold, for aluminium, for zinc. Where there used to be another mountain, there is now um, sort of the, the getting stone over out. So everything is becoming an image. Yeah? And that annihilates the thing faster and more assuredly than any atomic bomb. Mm. In a sense, the atomic bomb, when it will come, it will only destroy representations. There is nothing left for it to destroy. That's Heidegger's poetic and undoubtedly quite romantic vision of what is going on. Mm. Yeah? One second. So, obviously, I'm not saying we all need to now become Heideggerians, uh, but we need to understand what is his science, because it is really quite a powerful thing. And you can see how this, this way of thinking is, has a lot of um, agency mm -hmm. today, you know, it, it reverberates through a lot of the culture we're living in now. Yes. 
but it's very interesting to compare uh, what Hagen said with Carl Jung, who is also at a similar time, who also thinks that the science. Who, who is saying that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 leave Jung to one side because it's highly good. That's enough. Okay. Uh, you know. Otherwise, if we have too many uh, people coming to the party, we don't have a chance to speak to anyone. Um, so. But let's see a little bit more detail. What is he talking about here? The annihilation that science brings. So science is a force that annihilates. That is very Heideggerian. Science destroys. Yeah? Uh, this annihilation is so uncanny. You remember the word uncanny? Unhemlish, mm -hmm. uncanny valid. This annihilation is so terrifying, in other words, because it brings with it a twofold delusion. Twofold delusion. One for one. So put someone read to us the first delusion. Who is next? Please. Bottom of seven. Or oh, eight. But bottom of eight. Okay. Is it because of the annihilation so okay? For one. For one. The opinion that science, more so than all other experience would encounter the actual in its actuality. Second, the pretense that the thing could just as well be a thing, regardless of scientific research into the actual, which presupposes that there ever were essence in things at all. OK, so the two points, the two ways by which science annihilates everything, one is that the opinion that science, more so than any other experience, which means more, more so than art, more so than philosophy, more so than what else we have? Science, philosophy, art, is there anything else? I don't know, maybe, let's see. Um, so the opinion that science, more so than any other experience, would encounter the actual in its actuality. The belief that science is the most it's the thing that gets you closer to what is really going on. Because what scientists always say, they always say, through our methods, through our experiments, we can lift the skirts of Mother Nature and take a peek underneath and see what is really going on. Yeah? And this sort of uh, sexualized Oedipal image is not accidental. It's an image that scientists actually use, you know, to peek under the skirts of Mother Nature. You know, uh, to see what, what she has under the, the Brazilian, you know, uh, and uh, and this curiosity, you know, this idea that we need science in order to see what is really happening, is the first reason by which by which science is uh, annihilating the real, and the second is the pretense the misguided belief that a thing could, could just as well be a thing regardless of scientific research. That's a little bit like what Zach said, that even though science comes and says it's cavity, it doesn't stop us to see it as a thing. Heidegger doesn't think so. Heidegger believes that this is a pretense, which means it's a misguided thought, uh, because, because if the things had ever shown themselves as things, then the thinghood of the thing would have been evident. So, if it was true that we can still get hold of the thing as it is, even though science said that it's a cavity, then if that is true, why do we still not know what the thing is? And I think we don't know what the thing is because science came in between and all we can really get hold of now is representations. So it's, it's the same on Plato scale. You see how useful it is to understand what is the core philosophical problem and because we died from the very early days of this philosophy center, things kind of start to click into place because you realize actually in philosophy there is no progress. 
we're all the time dealing with the same thing. We just keep going around it in circles. Like if you ever uh, been uh, in therapy, if you ever had therapy, uh, then I, you probably notice that in therapy there is no the, the progress happens from going around the same things over and over and over again. You might find yourself in every therapy session talking about the same things, you know. But somehow going around over and over and over again makes you know these things that you overlooked in the past. And uh, for that reason, therapy can really be um, amazing. Um, so that's kind of similar with philosophy as well. It's not about, well, science is all about progress. You know, it's very important for science that the problems that ancient Greeks dealt with scientifically are not the same problems we deal with now. So you can really say, well, science is so much more advanced than it was 2,000 years ago. Can you really say that philosophy is so much more advanced? No, you, cannot, you also cannot say that art. Would you really say that our art is so much better than the Greek art? You know, you wouldn't say it's, it's kind of doesn't even make any sense. You look at the very early cave paintings uh, that are maybe 7,000 years old, and they are wonderful, wonderful art objects. You know? Um, is what we do now, is, is, is a huge progress? You know, would you say that Shakespeare is better than Homer? You know, you wouldn't. It's, it's kind of doesn't really make sense to talk about it like this. So, how is it that we allow the scientific way of thinking to come between us and the world? Yes, I don't think, I think it's, 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 it's saying it's science, not science, it's business, because the science that um, it's not science as well? It's not science that's created the issue, it's business, because it's business. business, it's a science, it's businesses that use science and use science in a way to profit it, that has overlooked what indigenous peoples and, and, and tribes uh, and the way they lived. And, yeah. and, 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 and you know, you could trace this back, and I think that's what he's saying, a long, long time ago, when, when Europeans started exploring the world and using their science. Um, and, and, you know, just, just, just right from the village in the world. So, I think so there, are lots of, sorry, there are lots of scientists that are naturalists, and they've been saying for a long time that we shouldn't be doing things, but it's the, their voice is, is, is overruled by the businesses that, that say, well, no, no, we can do this, we can do that, you know. Electricity, we take it as being clean energy, it's not clean. It might be clean in, in, in the room where we can receive it and use it, but it creates a tremendous amount of waste. And business said, well, we need nuclear power. You know, it's business that said, we need coal power. You know, steam, etc., etc. So it's business that drives those things. It's also interesting, you know, where is this idea of clean, cleanliness is coming from? You know, but I, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. And I also, I don't think Heidegger is kind of angry with scientists. Scientists do what their job description is. They do science. The problem is not, the, the problem is, maybe it is true, as you say, the problem is not so much the science itself, but the role it has in society as the dominant modality of engaging with the world. Yeah? Um, if we had, we, we could imagine a different culture in which there is science, and, but science sort of has its place, you know, just like, you know, art has its place, you know, it's called the gallery. So, but, you know, art is not the dominant universal discourse. So, and so on that level, I think you're right, and the way you bring in capitalism and business is very interesting, and I think it kind of resonates with what Heidegger is saying, look at what, uh, look at the next uh, paragraph, and who, is, who, who can read now, what is the basis, I just want this. What is the basis for the running of the theory of the thing as thing, as the human simply neglected to, to represent the thing as thing? The human can only neglect uh, what has already been allotted to him. The human can represent regardless of the manner 
only that which has first lit itself up from, the, from, up from itself and shown itself to be in the light that it brings to it. So this, I think, is quite clear, isn't it? Because it, it sort of says, how, how do you understand this? Anyone has any way of thinking about, about this uh, paragraph? Why the thing is not appearing to us as the thing? Heidegger asks. Is it because we simply neglected to represent the thing as a thing? So what else? What, what, what do you get from this paragraph? Everything is one. Everything is one? Yeah. Why? So, yeah, you also said that humans can only neglect what has already been allotted to him. So he already knows about the thingness of the thing. So what does it mean that humans can only neglect what has already been allotted to him? He already knows the thingness about the thing. No. Does it mean that? No, no I, I don't think Heidegger says at all that everything is one. No. <laughs> I you might say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. But we are asking about, about this paragraph. What does it mean that the human can represent, regardless of the manner, only that which has first lit itself up from itself and shown itself to him in the light that it brings with it? What do you think it means? I would say, because human controls the same. Yeah. I use science. So, the same. Uh, yes. Nice, nice. So That's good. The things I think for cannot be the same. That's that's good thinking. Yes, I I I I like what you're saying, uh, Reddy, because the the human what the human can represent. It's a bit like what you said earlier about science. The human can represent only that which first allow itself to be represented. Yeah. So, and now, drum roll, but what now is the thing as a thing such that its essence has never been able to appear? So what finally is the essence of the thing? So, uh, So, I will, now we're getting to actually Heidegger's answer to the thinness of the job. So page na, uh, nine, how does the empty of the job hold? And who will, who will read to us this? Okay. Um, okay. How does the empty of the job hold? It holds in that it takes what is heard into it, uh, it holds in that it retains what is taken up. The empty holds in a twofold manner, taking and retaining. The word of holding is thus ambiguous. The taking of what is heard in and the, the re retaining of the heard nonetheless belong, uh, belong together. Their unity, however, is uh, determined by the turning out uh, to which the jab as jab is uh, correlated, the twofold holding of the empty consequently lies in the output. And uh, as this, uh, the, the holding is authentically how it is. The output of, from all of the uh, jab is given uh, in the gift of the core. core, uh, core. Uh, there is sense. In some very senses, uh, uh, the holding of the vessel. Okay, great. Let's stop here for a second. In the gift of the poor, their essence is the holding of the vessel. So we are very close to what Heidegger believes is the essence of the jar. So let's go through this paragraph. Thank you very much for reading it um, line by line. So, so how does the jar hold? It holds in that it takes what is put in, yeah? So, it holds in the same, in the sense that it retains what is taken up. So, 
To hold means two things. It means to take and retain. So, you know, my flask, let's say, took some tea from the canteen, so it received it, and now it also retains it. Yeah? To receive and to retain. Okay? So, uh, and what is receiving and retaining amounts to? That it's why do you receive and retain the jar? So at some point you will be able to pour out of the jar. Yeah? Let me remind you of the jar we are talking about. Yeah? So uh, so the jar receives and retains in order so later it will be possible to pour out. Okay, so so far, so simple. Yeah? Um, this pouring out, this outpour from the jar is giving. In the gift of the pool, there are essences of the holding of the vessel. So imagine that we are sitting to a I invited you to my house to a to a dinner. And we are sitting around the table and there are glasses on the table and I bring out a jug of, uh, of wine, for instance, and I pour it in your glasses, yeah? And this is my gift to you. You are my, my um, guest, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You are my guest, and I'm pouring the wine into your glasses, and this is hospitality. This is welcoming. This is a gift, yeah? So. And, and Heidegger says, here is the essence of the jar, that no scientific research will be able to capture. The jar functions in the delicate relationship between the guest and the host, in the welcoming of you around my table, in the making you feel at home, and in basically getting the celebration or the party started. In the gift of the poor, their essence is the holding of the vessel. This whole trouble of making the jar, this whole trouble of making it from air, of giving it a certain shape, giving it a handle, it was all so I will be able to offer you a gift. Yeah? Now, this gifting of the wine is obviously specific to the jar. If you came around my table and I took out, not a jar, if I brought out, let's say, a hammer or a mincemeat, you know, it would be a different thing altogether. So, whatever thing you want to talk about, you need, you really need to ask afresh, every time again, what is the essence of this thing? The essence of the notebook will be different from the essence of the jar. Maybe the jar is about gifting. Is the notebook about gifting? No, I don't think so. Um, the, the notion of, even though I can give you a notebook as a gift, the notebook essence is not gifting. Yeah? If the essence of the jar is the gifting of the wine, what do you think is the essence of the notebook? Maybe recording. Yeah. So if let's say the jar, you see how we can use Heidegger to take it into a different territory. If if the, if the no, the, the notebook also holds. Yeah? It holds my thoughts, it holds my dream, it holds my plans, my calendar. Okay, how does it hold? It holds with the paper, yeah, and the cover perhaps. Yeah? Uh, but so in, in what way it holds? It holds in the way that it allows you to write and also preserves it. Yeah, in a sense also kind of hides it. Um, so perhaps something to do with hiding is essential to the know. Because I can write something and I can close it and then it's hidden. Yeah? And you don't know what thoughts I have about it because I don't think it's all in the little Yeah. Um, so 
the notebook will have a different essence to the job. But that's how you get to the essence. You know, you could do the same thing with flamenco. You could do the same thing with uh, reeds. You know, it's just about really asking what what is it doing in my life, in my life, not scientifically, but how am I using this thing? Because also it could be that my use of the notebook is different from yours. You know, maybe for me it's hiding. For you is actually if you're writing in the notebook because you want to publish it and you know and make yourself famous. So it could be that the essence of the notebook for you will be different. But that's how you get to the essence. Uh, okay, is this good? Yes? Question? Uh, yes? I was curious, uh, if, if, if you can accept that the essence of the object is subjective, then... I can see why... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think you're right to, uh, to set the trap for it. Uh, the, I, I'm not saying that the, the essence is subjective. I'm saying that that you need to work it out for yourself. Yeah? Okay. Because, because I, I'm not sure that, that even with the job, that it is universally one thing for everyone. I think Heidegger believed that. But I'm not sure. And, and it's an open question. Maybe the job in your house is used uh, as a toilet. Yeah? And by the way, Many jars that you see in the British Museum were used as toilets. We now look at them as beautiful apples, but people used to piss in them and go out of For that reason, I think when Bouchard puts the urinal in the, toy in the museum, he's not so far off because the museums are full of urinals, they just we don't recognize them as such. But like, with the, the jug, the essence adds up as far as you give me, and you, even if you piss in a jug, you're still. It's, it still works. Well, it, it, it works in a different... It, then it becomes something else, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you need to work out for yourself. And we're not talking about the universal, like once and for all. Actually, if you pee in the job, the job also holds. Yes, it does hold. But perhaps then, then it's not so much a question of gifting. Of course, you can imagine a party with which that would be your gift to the, to the guests. Uh, and uh, Pasolini has a film about it, uh, 100 Days of Sodom, Solo, yeah, which is fantastic, yes. I think the essence is about the holding itself, it's not about the giving. No, 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 no. <laughs> but Heidegger might disagree. In the gift of the poor, their essence is the holding of the vessel. I think it's, it, it can be uh, explained like, like this way. If I call a thing, yeah. the thing, its essence is whole, whatever it is, but it's not if. Uh, the thing related to you, uh, there will be like, if I, uh, you are host and we are guests, yeah. then it's about giving. Yeah. But the thing, the essence about the thing, I think, is about holding. But so why, why do you think Heidegger says, in the gift of the poor, their essence is the holding of the vessel? For Heidegger, Heidegger believes, maybe wrongly, yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's fine to disagree with Heidegger, you know? Uh, he believes that the essence of the job is in the gifting. And I will tell you why. Because Heidegger really thinks about the job in the context of, um, of let's say, uh, in the context of these kind of jobs, uh, which are the Greek ur urns, um, that were often used specifically for wine, for celebrations. I, I guess it maybe because uh, only human components, if the drug is, is itself just a drug, it can only hold, but yeah. when human yeah. uses it, yeah. 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 Very good, that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Excellent, <laughs> good, good thinking, good work, yes. Uh, maybe uh, he means that uh, only the thing that can hold can give. Yes. That's why only the thing that can hold can give. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. why. That's true. Well, I, 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 we had a little nuanced discussion here whether there is a kind of. What I'm trying to say is that we don't need to feel that there is only one way 
to relate to the jug. The jug in your household and in my household can have a different role. The question is to work out what is your relationship with it. If someone worked out for themselves, it doesn't mean that it, it equally applies to you. You know, it's just like the street outside my house leads me to certain things. The street outside your house leads me to other things. Equally, we, we, what, what is equal is that we both uh, we have a very special relationship to our own street. But this relationship can be different. For you, it might be where you walk your dog. For me, it might be where I go for a run, for instance, yeah? But, but the intimate relationship is the same. Does it make sense? Yeah? So what I'm talking about here is how the thing you are working with as artists, because that's all, ultimately what it's all about, you need to work through exactly the Heideggerian method what the thing you are working with means. So for instance, this musical instrument, what it's called, that you do later your own with your thumbs. Kalimba, yeah. Yeah. So you could think about it in the same way. What what is it? Okay, it making it, it making sounds. How does it make sound? It makes sounds with metal plates and a whole body. But this is really not not, not the essence of the thing. Um, what is the essence? Is it um, that the sound is uh, a form of meditation or a form of prayer. Is it entertainment? Is it, well, it clearly involves giving something to people. Maybe not. Maybe it's something that you do for personal pleasure. But that's how you start working out what this thing really means to you. And once you do that, then you can, then your understanding of it becomes much richer and your ability to make an artwork that explores that gets somehow more you, you have to, you have a direction rather than looking at it and saying, yes, this is a musical instrument, it has a pentatonic scale and whatever. It allows you to really ask what place it feels in my life. Maybe it actually feels a place of having a friend. You know? I had someone telling me the other day. How uh, he said, um, he said, my trombone saved my life because I was so lonely in high school. I didn't have any friends, and the only the only friend I had was my trombone, and and th that that's how I survived my teenage teenager years by playing. So the trombone there was this this musical instrument was not about performing. It was a friend. Yeah. Now that could be different from someone else for whom this is there is, a di there is a different relationship. So you can't work what you work it out for yourself. Yeah? So uh, who worked with leaves? Well, you worked with leaves. Yeah? So now there are no more leaves because we are in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. But so what does autumn leaves mean for you? They clearly had a lot of meaning. Yeah? Is, was it about missing a different landscape? Was it about some kind of longing? Was it about um, you know making something you know to welcome people into your house? That's that's what you need to work out with the material you are dealing with. Yes. So uh, having that at the entanglement mm. can be like are we talking about the same thing or what is the? I think I think that's kind of another sense. Take this relationship to the thing. To the next step, and she says she talks about this entanglement because she uses quantum physics. So for her, the thing is a wild thing. It kind of speaks back to you. It's um, it's not standing there waiting to be discovered. It's also discovering you in the process. Yeah, I think I think that's right. But again, as with um, Jung, we're not going to now go there. Uh, Okay. Yes. I wanted to ask, ask how you have put something like what you had just said before and you were like, ah, that sounded really good. Yeah. Can you repeat it? Um, <laughs> but like, how would you do that? It's about the sentence in the gates of the poor, their essence, the holding of the vessel. So uh, a job can only hold, but uh, only 
only human can pull it. So that's a yes. Sir. Yeah. So that's a connection yeah. with uh, to, from you to the thing to the job. So, the, in the scientific understanding of the jar as a cavity, there is no room for human agency. But what you are saying in the Heideggerian, the jar, as we said in, in earlier, you remember the jar holds and it has a handle, it holds it by the handle, how the jar is an extension of human qualities. Now, who can give gifts? Who is giving gifts? Giving gifts is a human activity. No? One of the very ancient activities is, is gifting. Um, um, French anthropologist Maus, M-A-U-S-S, uh, wrote a book on gifting uh, as one of the most basic human behaviors. When you uh, need gifting as a way of creating a relationship, if I give you a gift, then you might not kill me, then you might protect me, uh, then you, you might give me a gift back. We, you know how, how in, in so many cultures there is this exchange of gifts happening uh, when, let's say, uh, two people get married, then there is a dowry, let's say exchange of gifts between families. Now, you give me something of yours, I give you something of mine, then we create a bond, then we're going to, we create a kind of a commitment. Yeah? So gifting is a very essential human behavior. So the job is really participating in a human behavior, in human activity. How can science capture that? Yeah? There is no way because it doesn't have the instrument to address gifting. Okay. We can get very, very close. I'm excited. Uh, so who 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 will believe? The next thing. Okay, Ruth. So I want you to read. Uh, 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 read from here. This. The judgment of the jug, essences in the gift of the form. Even the empty jug retains its essence from out of the gift even if an empty jug is not capable of an outpouring. But this not capable is appropriate to the jug and to the jug alone. A scythe, on the contrary, or a hammer, are incapable of achieving the not capable of this gift. That's typical Heidegger. You get used to his uh, shtick by now, no? <laughs> you see how, how, how it works. Uh, now, see how he needs to twist language to say what he wants, the janghood of the jar. Who's who ever heard of language that is the janghood? What is janghood? You know? Uh, what, what is this thing? Like, we know neighborhood. Yeah? What is neighborhood? Hood is a kind of. Let's, let's, something, let, let, what, what, what kind of. Uh, what, what kind of words with who do you know? Neighborhood? Brotherhood? Yeah. What, and what do you think this brotherhood means? What is brotherhood? What is brotherhood? It's a relationship between brothers. Yeah? So the good is kind of a, a, a relationship. Yeah? So Heidegger needs to say things like a childhood to suggest that there is a relationship with a job. So the job of uh, the job of the job essences in the gift of the poor. Yeah? The essence of the job is in the gift of the poor. Even, even the empty job retains its essence. Even the job that has nothing to pour still retains its essence because even though it's not capable of pouring, only the jar is not capable of pouring. A kind. Do you know what this kind is? A is a farm instrument. Yeah, a kind that you use to. Um, what is, what is it called? Like white the Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is, 
is not capable of outpushing, yeah, or a hammer. It can, it, it can. You wouldn't say that the hammer is not capable of pouring wine. It just doesn't make sense, yeah. A jug, an empty jug, is not capable of pouring, but but it still retains the quality of pouring even if it's empty. It's kind of interesting how we makes you think in a specific way, you see? And that's really the whole point of these sessions. Not to teach you what to think, but how to think. And Heidegger is very good at this. How, how to really think of the essence of something and not to get confused between the real essence and something secondary. So even, an, even the empty jar has gifting as an essence because a, a, a hammer cannot gift wine, cannot out pour. Well, obviously, you cannot pour wine from a hammer, but you wouldn't even say that in a sentence. Yeah? Because what, it, it, it's kind of, well, unless you are Dr. Seuss or, I don't know, uh, uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatever. Yes? So you use a jug as a hammer because you don't have a hammer. Yeah? Is it poorly participating in hammer? Uh, well, well, the jug. Yes. I, yes. Well, according, according to Heidegger, I don't know, but, but that's, that is something that, uh, as an artist, you definitely can do precisely to explore yeah. the thing good of something. Because like, as a scientist, you'd say, okay, this is heavy, it's not hard enough, you can smash it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, I think I gave you an example in the past, what happens when you uh, Attach strings to a table and play on it as if it's a violin, you know. And it's, but we're not talking here about definitions. And clearly, you can use a jar as an hammer. Then, I think in the Heideggerian understanding, you you don't really see. Yeah, it's, it's the, the the essence of the jar is being wasted, you know, and. But you wouldn't be able to use a hammer as a jack. No. 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 And the jack, well, okay, that, that is quite clear. Now, the gift of the poor can be a libation. There is water, there is wine to drink. Uh, what is a libation? Do you know this word? Very nice word. What is that libation? Libation is an offering to the gods. Have you ever been to a funeral when people pour some cognac on the grave? You know, every person used to be a drinker, you pour some cognac or you leave uh, some, you know, hash in the ground, you know, for the person if they were, or you leave some cigarettes, you know? So that is elevation, it's offering. You know? Traditionally, in the Greek custom, before every meal that you eat, you make an offering to the gods. If you read Homer, Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, every time they sit down to their meal of bread and meat, uh, they burn some meat on the fire for the gods. That's elevation. So every time we sit down to drink wine, we also pour some on the altar. I mean, it's a bit like uh, if you walk into a Hindu household, there will be a Ganesh and the garage to have a banana or some nuts or something like that, you know, and there will be an offering for the God, yeah? I think in some cultures there is an offering to Buddha as well, yeah? There will be like flowers, for instance, in maybe in many uh, Thai temples. Yeah, is it familiar to you? Yeah, this offering? That's, that's kind of what elevation is about. So the gift of the poor can be elevation. There is water, there is wine to drink. Now, uh, to the next paragraph, can someone read to us? In the water of the deep, there abides the spring. In the spring abides the stone and all the dark slumber of the earth, which receives the rain and dew of the sky. In the water of the spring, there abides the marriage of sky and earth. They abide in the wine that the fruit of the vine provides, in which the nourishment of the earth and the sun of the sky are betrothed to each other. 
in the gift of the water, in the gift of the wine, there abides the each case, the sky and the earth. The gift of the power, however, is the job root of the job. In the essence of the job, there abides earth and sky. Okay, so this, now you see Heidegger left behind all the things he argued against. He tells you what he thinks really is the essence of the job. So he says, well, first, pouring out is like an offering to the God. Now, is Heidegger here wants us to be all kind of religious? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's at all about religion. We will come to this in a minute. I think it's more to do with tradition. This offering of libation is often to do with uh, the dead, with the memory of the past generations, which is, let's say, our own history. Now, in the water of the gift, there abides the spring. When I did, so, when I put water into your glasses, the water came from the spring. The spring that trans down the mountain is called icy water from the mountain. Uh, that runs down the stone and the dark slop, the dark slaughter of the earth. You know, he is his element now. Um, Heidegger, I think, he is secretly a poet. It is. Not that secretly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and um, so the rain that came down from the clouds and enriched the soil and, um, and the snow and the towing of the snow and the slumber of the earth and the stones and the minerals. And so in this glass of water that you are, you are being served, all these elements abide. The earth, the sky, the stone, the whole of the natural world is in this glass of water. Plus some chlorine, if you are in London, some uh, calcium, some fluoride, and all these other things as well. Yeah? Uh, but in the Greek world that Heidegger wants us to think about, which, and this I think, is also really politically problematic. The way he fetishizes this ancient, simplicity but natural life. Uh, it all sounds very lovely until you realize that that was also the Nazi agenda of, you know, the earth and the soil. The most, um, the, 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 there was this publication, there was this uh, even, even a whole political movement um, of the Nazi party that was called Earth and blood. Earth and blood. So, and this notion that you know that you die for this earth, that the earth is a nourishment, that the earth is the mother. So it's all very poetic and beautiful. It has a dark undertone to it, which I don't want you to forget about. Um, so and if we pour the wine, then in this wine, in this red liquid we pour into the glasses, there is the grey and the soul, and the sun, and the labor of the farmer, and all of that is in this. And, and in the essence of the jug, there abides earth and sky. Also, I think, because the jug is made out of earth and burned in the fire, yeah? So fire, water, earth, and the sky are all in, so what is the essence of the jug? Fire, water, air, sky, air, yeah? It's all in the jar. Okay, and let me just see. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's do a few lines here. Uh, the gift of the poor, you can just go? Yeah. The gift of the poor is a libation for the mortals. It quenches their thirst, it enlivens their efforts, it heightens their sociability. But the gift of the jug is also at times given a consecration. If the poor is a consecration, then it does not appease a thirst. It appeases a celebration, a festival, and high. Now the gift of the poor is neither given in the tavern nor is the gift elevation for mortals. Port is your 
oblation spent for the immortal gods. The gift of the poor as oblation is an authentic gift. Let's stop here. A couple of words we need to explain. So libation, we know what it is. Yeah, let me have this open it in the dictionary explain for you. A libation is a drink pulled down as an offering to a deity. Yeah? Okay. So we have a couple of other words that we need to clarify. Uh, what is consecration? To make sacred. Yeah. Consecration from sacred is to make something, again, it's a very religious term, to make something sacred. How do you make something sacred? Well, you need to do a ritual. And the ritual can involve, for instance, pouring wine at the corners of the temple, or something like that. Yeah? And then it becomes sacred ground. How do you make something sacred? Sometimes you draw a, a pentagram in the middle of the room, you like you light five candles. Yeah? So, uh, what else do we have? What about the word? Uh, oblation. Oblation. What is oblation? Yes. What is oblation? It's giving bread and meat to the gods. Yeah? Another thing. So, oblation and, and libation are all, all these, it's, it's all about this offering. What Heidegger is talking about here? He wants, to, he wants you to realize that the jar has a certain spirituality to it. You can call it, um, well, it, the spirituality can be religious, but it doesn't need to be. Um, it's the, point, the point is that science wants you to see the jar as a purely physical cavity that holds liquid. Heidegger says, well, it's also a spiritual object because it can be used in a religious, it, it can be used and it is used in a religious ceremony. It, it, it is a spiritual object, it is an object of uh, friendship and gifting, and it's also, um, it's also a kind of social lubricant, as people call alcohol sometimes, because it says, um, it, it quenches their thirst, yeah, so you are thirsty, I pour you water from the jar, it quenches your thirst, basically gives you life, it enlivens their efforts, and heightens their social, social ability. Well, clearly, once we all had some of my wine, we all become much more merry, and we talk louder, and we, are, we, we find each other much more interesting for a while, so we are much more sociable. So, so this jar is also acting in the kind of creating social cohesion between people. Yeah? And all of this is the jar. And now, uh, and now, I'm going to skip because he gets into a little bit of, uh, of uh, discussion here about the origin of the word thing, yeah. and we're going to skip that. Um, it's, it's not uninteresting. I think it goes back to Gervania and Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 but I, I, I want to get to, to the most. Okay. And, uh, So, this is really nice. Who could read to us? The mortals are the humans. The mortals are humans. They are common mortals. They are to die. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I will stop you. Because I think this is really nice. I want everyone to be able to read. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The immortals are the humans. They are called immortals because they are able to die. Dying means to be capable of death as well. Only a human dies. The animal comes to an end. It has death as death, neither before it nor after it. Thus it is shrink of the nothing, namely of that which in all respects is 
is never something we are being, but nonetheless as it, namely as being itself. Thus, as the shrink of nothing harbors in itself for the essence of being, as the shrink of the nothing, thus is a refuge of refuge of being. Mortals will now name mortals now because their earthly life ends, but rather because they are capable of death and death. The models are who they are as models by asking in the refuge of being. They are the asking relationship to being as being. Thank you. This is pretty intense. And you read very well. Thank you very much. Now, it's almost, I think what Heidegger is doing here is that, okay, you understood how we get to the essence of the job. Now, let's use the same approach to understand the essence of the human. So the humans are called mortals. For instance, in Homo, humans are often called mortals. Now, why humans are called mortals? The mortals are the humans. They are called mortals. And do you understand the meaning of the word mortal? Yes. From what word it is? Mort, which is French for dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are called mortals because they are able to die. Isn't it beautiful? Humans are called mortals because they are able to die. Strange thing to say, no? Because doesn't everything die? You know? Every, isn't like everything here going to perish one day? Uh, no, not according to Heidegger. Dying means to be capable of death as death. Only the human dies. Why do you think Heidegger says only the human dies? Because we can think of death as death. Exactly. Did you hear that? That's very true. That, that's absolutely correct, Nico. Because only humans, Heidegger says, can think of death as death. The animal comes to an end. So what is the difference between the human and the animal? What is the difference between the human and the animal? Yes. That's right. The animal doesn't. That's right. Yeah. So now, whether you agree with it or not, I, I, it doesn't matter at the moment. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot to say about it. And we know that some animals mourn, um, others do die. Um, so, again, there's no point arguing with Heidegger. What we try to do is to understand what he's saying. He said, so what is the essence of the... If we understood that the essence of the jar is the gift, and the essence of the jar is the sky and the air and the fire and the water, so what is the essence of the human? The essence of the human is death. The essence of the human is death. Because only the human can die. Only the human is capable of death as death. Only the human dies. The animal comes to an end. It has death as death, neither before it nor after it. The animal doesn't have death as something that waits, that awaits in the end. According to Heidegger, by the, by the way, the human also doesn't have death as something that waits at the end. The human has death as something that's present in their life all the time. You know? And that, that is very important in Heidegger. gets much more discussed and more depth in his big book, Being in Time, when he says that, uh, he speaks about Living, to, living towards death. It's, he says that there are two ways basically you can live your life. You can pretend that death is, well, there are three ways you can live your life. You can pretend that death will never happen and just live as if there is no death. You can pretend, you can either, alternatively, you can say, well, I know that I will die one day, but not now, and I don't need to really worry about it because when it will come, it will come, and by until it comes, I can just live my life as if I'm never going to die. 
and one day I will prove the wrong, but by that time I'm dead, so who cares? Yeah? That's the, that's the way most of us live. We know that we're going to die, but we don't want to think about it today or tomorrow, and we just live as if we have all the time in the world. And there is the third way, which for Heidegger is the only authentic way, is to live every minute from full awareness of death as being here right now. Death being this integral part of your current being. So your current being is already saturated with death. That's how he believes is the authentic life. It actually on some level corresponds with Buddhism. Don't you think? Yeah? Um, and and I, I think I mentioned to some of you that German philosophy since the 19th century was influenced by, um, to some extent, not, not usually, but to some extent, um, Eastern teachings of Zen and of uh, Upanishads and, and the Bhagavad Gita uh, were translated to German and German philosophy from Schopenhauer onwards is aware of these this thoughts and influenced by them. But that for Heidegger is the authentic, authentic way of living is living with death as, in, as being co-present. So your current moment is a moment of dying. Yeah? Heidegger will say no one is too young to die. A newborn baby is already dying. Which is definitely not a thing to say to the, the happy parents. Uh, and I don't, don't suggest you do that. But for Heidegger, this is the true state of affairs. No one is too young to die. And the moment one is born, one is already dying. I think it gives you the word to be like yeah. you are only have what we can have is only now. Yes. So we every time uh, each, every time we are dying also we are we well, that, that's not exactly what I think. I think talk about rebirth. No. You know, because you might, it's easy to think that Heidegger brings back some kind of theology. He's not. He's not talking about, even though he speaks a lot about some kind of um, divinities and gods and the sacrifices, he's not talking about gods at all. He really speaks about the, the materiality, the essence of human existence as living towards death. Uh, um, yes. Does it also mean that uh, being human beings as beings, uh, being dead is same as sorry. Being we reach to a place after death, and then we're not we, talking about any place after death. No, and, that's not I do. No, no, no. <laughs> Being, is being dead same as not being born? <laughs> That's nothing to do with what we read here. Uh, so, you also said that human beings are, what is that? Capable of death as death. Yes. yes. Capable of death as death means capable of awareness of death. Yeah. So yeah. Only, the, only the human he says, is capable of death as death, so, out of real death. The, is it awareness of death or is it experience of death? I mean, well, what is it's, it's, it's the knowledge that we are mortal. Only the human knows that they are going to die. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's nothing to do with afterlife. No. <laughs> it's it's only the human knows that they are going to die. So this knowing makes it uh, death death as death. Yes. Okay. okay. So death is the shrine of the nothing. Remember the nothing, our old friend the nothing? Death is the shrine of the nothing, namely of that which in all respects is never some mere being but nonetheless essences 
as being itself. So death is the essence of being. If you ask what is the essence of being, is death. That's how you What is the essence of being human is being mortal. Yeah. Now, this is not at the center, if I think, is it some kind of sort of gothic nihilism? Oh, you know, we're going to die. No, no, it's... What Heidegger feels is that we most of the time live our lives in the kind of oblivion, not really understanding what is going on, because we don't want to face what is really going on what is really going on is yeah. that the essence of our life is death. Yeah? Um, and it's hard to read it without sort of feeling that uh, there is something deeply uh, pessimistic. But I don't think Heidegger is coming to it from a pessimism. He's speaking about what does it mean to read, to really live, not to live in a kind of haze, not to live in a dream. To really grasp what you have and get the most out of it. He says, in order to really get to the essence of what is going on with your life, you cannot, you need to know what is your essence, and your essence is dying. Uh, the mortals, we now name the mortals not because their early life ends, no. The mortals, we now name the mortals, not because their earthly life ends, but rather because they are capable of death as death. So we are mortal, not because we are dying, we will die one day, but because we are capable of knowing that death is our essence. The mortals are who they are as mortals by essencing in the refuge of being. They are the essence in relationship to being as being. So basically, what does it mean to be human is the essence of the relationship of being as being. Being is dying. The human, essentially, the human is not a person with a name, Daniel, with two legs, two arms. No, the human is the essence of the relationship to be as dying. Yeah. In the same way that you could say that the, the ego, you know, the beard, the bird, the ego is, is the, the instinct of flying. You know? There is this urge to fly that has the shape of a bird. You know? This urge to roll the skies, the urge to kill little birds is a cat, for instance. Yeah? And I adore cats, all mine especially. But they really are killing machines. There's no point to come to a cat and say, you are a bad cat, why, why do you kill birds? The cat is this desire to kill manifest in a cute way. Yeah? And the human is the desire to die manifest in flesh and bone. Yeah? The human is the expression of the essence of being. The essence of being is death. And the human, the human to death is what evil is to flying. Yeah? This death is our wings, if you like. You know, in the same way that the, the eagle, um, anyone read um, Jonathan Livingstone, the, what is it called? Um, uh, Jonathan Livingstone, the seagull? Anyone read this book? It's about a seagull that, uh, it's a really good book. If you have a if you have a chance, 
General Convenience of the Seagull, you see how many uh, stars it has. It's a great book. It's about this seagull, which is a seabird, that all the others fly to find food, but he's just flying for the heavy it and making sort of circles in the air, you know, and just flying because he really loves flying. And all the other birds are very angry with him for that. You know, but he's just doing it for fun and not for any purpose. So just like the seagull is born to fly, and flying is the expression of its destiny, so is death for us. That's Heidegger's big reveal. Um, okay, so, uh, Zach, is it you now? Could you read us from here? Um, up to here. Earth and sky, divinity and world belong together and united on themselves. In the single fold of the unifying portal, each of the four in its way mirrors the essence of the remaining others in it. Each is thus reflected in its way back into what, it, uh, what is its own within the single form and the form. Okay, so you might ask, okay, where is the jab in all this? So the jab is coming back. Earth and the sky, divinities and mortals belong together. Now, the way to understand it is this is the, the famous fourfold that Heidegger is talking about. Um, um, yeah, it, it goes away for a while. But we're going back to the jump, the, the, the famous jump. is the air, the air that the jack is made of, uh, and the fire that burned it, and the um, water that was used in its making and also that it holds, um, and the offerings to the gods, but also, you know, what, what do we do when we sit around the table and we drink wine, we chat, we tell stories, we reminisce about the past, you know? We basically produce culture. We tell each other fairy tales. We talk about movies we saw. We make memories for the future to remember at the next gathering. That's how culture happens. So you don't need to send it to go to the gods, but the earth, human culture, the sky, and us, mortals. It's all there in the jar, yeah? So what is the essence of the jar? Its being is the earth and the sky, divinities and mortals. So the ground that we stand on, the sky above, so the ground that we stand on, you know, it is this ground that made us. We are born of this specific earth, the little rock, the, the seventh rock from the sun. Yeah? This specific earth. You know, some people believe that once we make this earth uninhabitable, we can just take our iPads, go to a spaceship, go to Mars, and start afresh. Now, Heidegger would say to that, you are fools, because there will be no starting afresh. If your earth will be the earth of Mars, there will be, it will not be the same humans who will be walking it. It will be completely different humans. And it does make sense. On Mars there is no atmosphere, so you will have to live in sort of the glass domes uh, with uh, sort of pumped air, you will be eating uh, basically your own excrement enriched with vitamins. Uh, and, uh, and do you think 
you like to continue as normal? Do you think it will be basically the same? No, it will be a completely different form of life because the earth will be different. So the earth that the jab is made of is also the earth that makes us who we are. The reason we are the way we are, with that many fingers, that many legs, these various abilities, they were they are both wrought by this environment that we are living in. A different environment will produce a completely different human. Yeah? And the sky, the sky is the limit of our world. You know? What is beyond the sky? Well, various things, but definitely not us. What us is, is the limit, is our boundary beyond the sky. I'm not saying we cannot go beyond the sky, but what I will say, it will not be the same thing. You will, it, it, it will be something else. Because these are the real physical conditions that make you who you are. And then there are the mortals, us for whom death is our abode. Death is our safe place, if you like, our security blanket. Um, we are born to death in the same way that birds are born to fly. And then there are the divinities. What are divinities? Well, it's, this is our culture. This is what's been passing through the generations. The literature, the books, the fairy tales, the music, the songs, um, the hymns. That is the divinities. Yeah? Again, we don't need to go necessarily to any kind of religion. So, culture. The earth, the sky, our own mortality, all that is the essence of the jack. All of that is in the jack. And so you see how far away it went from looking at it as a cavity with a volume of something. For Heidegger, the jam holds, in a sense, it's a mirror of our own existence, of its ground, its limitation, its history, and its existence as finite and more. Yeah, all of that, that is the job. Um, and Can someone read this? The thing lets the poor fall by. The thing lets the thing things the world. Everything lets the poor fall by in something that each time abides in a single fold in the world. Thank you very much, man. So the fourfold is what we said earlier. The air, the sky, the divinities, and the mortals. So this fourfold. What it means in your own life, you know? It means you have some culture that you brought with you here. You have some history. Again, different from every, for everyone. You have a ground on which you are walking. You have the sky that is your horizon, that is your the limit. You have your own mortality. All of that somehow you bring to this table when you come here. Somehow all of that is also part of your practice. In your practice, as in the job, your ground, your limits, your mortality, and your culture are reflected. Not reflected, reflected is not the right word, but they live there. They live in all of these things, live in your practice. Yet, yeah, as an artist. Somehow they find their way there. And sometimes we see it in some of your works, it can really be seen, and maybe more often than you imagine. But that really Heidegger's conception of the essence of the job, also the essence of the artwork. These four elements that are completely interlinked. They belong together on its own, none of them makes any sense. What does divinities correspond to? Culture. Culture. Yeah. So each one of you 
brings some culture with you. And that is the stories your mother told you, the TV programs you watch, the songs you remember as a child, the scents you remember, the blossoming, you know, and for every one of us, these things are different, but we all have something like that. We all have a ground. How do you understand the ground? Well, on some level, it is the earth, but perhaps the ground has some other meaning as well. Yeah, maybe it is to do with your family, your upbringing. Then there is the sky. The sky is very interesting. The sky is the light, but it's also the limit, you know? And we all bring here to our practice our sense of being mortal, our sense of that being is fine, you know? And without the sense, perhaps there is no, no possibility of making art. Uh, Socrates said, Socrates, remember? And uh, he said, philosophy is the art of dying. Mm -hmm. But perhaps art is also the art of dying. Uh, and again, it's not, I don't want to understand it as something really dark or misanthropic or nihilistic. I actually think it's very energetic, you know? Because it means, well, you just cannot afford wasting your time on stupid things. Because there is an end to it, you know, there is a there is a finite amount. So think very carefully because you before you you know spend your time with the wrong people doing the wrong things. Uh, because if you really live your life from awareness of its feeding you, you might First, might worry less about minor problems that always happen. And you might be more grateful for the experiences that this present moment holds. Yeah? Because it's not going to happen again. There is a certain, you know, uh, again, going back to Greta Thunberg, uh, one of the things I think she is saying is that the huge mistake. The, the, the biggest lie in pretending, she says, so, you know, it's world leaders and business leaders, as, uh, as Ken, you were saying earlier, is that the biggest lie is that there is sort of, there is a possibility of, of, to have an infinite progress, that the sky is the limit, that the resources are infinite or limitless. So whenever someone talks to you about something limitless, you know in your heart of hearts that they're telling you a lie because we are not limitless. We are not infinite. We are finite. So that's what I do, in a sense, is saying. How, how do you live your life as an artist? Yeah? From this awareness of thinking. Uh, and I think in that we actually did come to the very last of this, uh, of this essay. Uh, and just this final two lines. Could so who, who is could, could you read, please, Anna? You can have one. Page uh, twenty. Uh, <coughs> humans as the mortals are the first to dwell in the world as well. Only what the life of the world ever becomes a thing. Okay. Humans as the mortals are the first to dwell in the world as world. Only what is slight world ever becomes a thing. What do you think about that? Do you have any thoughts? How to understand it? Anything here you don't understand? Basically, as we proclaim ourselves, uh, the ones who can die and basically the world. So, so can, can you say it again? Is it slower? Um, so, as humans, I think they claim this off the authors as we create in this world, basically. Yeah. We are creating something, so things are under our control, mm -hmm. basically. That's how I see it. Only what is slight of world ever becomes a thing. 
That's that's quite mysterious. No? Yeah, exactly. Like what, is, what is slight? What what is the, what, what is something slight? <laughs> I, I, I maybe I slightly scratched your car. You tell your father. Yeah. You know. What does it mean? The world is um the world is a is a is a thing just like each other. So uh -huh. If the world is human made, it's, yes. it's something that we use. Then, in order to understand the essence of the world, you have to stop seeing the world as a world. You have to stop seeing it as, as made. Yeah. That's right. Very good. And these are the last lines of this essay. So that's it. We're done. And what we do next time, um, I need to think about it. But well done, you. That was uh, that was quite. Can you put that language in the language in the end? Well, then you have to do the next task. We get your call. Obviously. Yeah. I still don't okay. understand uh, the slide of the word. <laughs> what did we forget? Oh, the technology. Okay, yeah. well, that's, that's yeah. a good point. Remind me next, yeah. next time to start with that. Yes, Roger. I still don't understand what is the slide. What does that mean? <laughs> Can, what, what, what do you think? Can someone answer that? I feel like it means like only a like, reveal of the world as it becomes a thing. Like uh, how it might reveal itself to us, or it's well, like me. Well, slide is something very fragile, you know. So there is a sense of fragility. So only something very fragile becomes a thing. Only something that is already pregnant with its demise, pregnant with ending, becomes a thing. So the thing embodies, in a sense, what is the essence of being? Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the thing becomes a thing when it embodies the essence of being. Good. Good. It's mysterious, isn't it? It is a little bit mysterious. And that's how what Heidegger wants you to understand ultimately about the thing. It is mysterious. For science, nothing is mysterious. Everything has a very clear answer. So death is a slide of world. The thing has a slightness. It's the essence of the world is what? What is the essence of being? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So only that which touches onto the essence of the world becomes a thing. Only that which touches onto the demise, the mortality, the finitude becomes a thing. Again, it is mysterious, and that is the final takeaway, that the thing is a mystery. So, one way. Next week. Next week. No, there is that. So we are hopeless. But now, we have a much more important question, which is your assignment.